What you are about to see is no ordinary video. It is the last discovery of a man rated by many as the greatest living scientist this century. It contains a message he wanted you to hear in order to prevent the single greatest cause of premature death. Dr. Linus Pauling, the only scientist ever to have won two unshared Nobel Prizes, as well as 48 honorary doctorates, realized that the foundation of health depends on taking into the body the right molecules, the right food. He called this approach orthomolecular medicine. His investigations into the extraordinary properties of vitamin C led him and his associate, Dr. Matthias Rath, to uncover what may prove to be the primary cause of heart disease. The case of Gary, my first patient to follow Dr. Linus Pauling's recommendations, illustrates the importance of what you're about to hear. Gary first came to see me after having had three strokes. He had such severe angina that a brisk walk would bring on extreme pain. Tests showed that one of his coronary arteries was completely blocked. He had high blood pressure and was taking three drugs to help control this. Within only five months following Dr. Pauling's recommendations given on this video, he had a normal blood pressure without drugs and could get his heart rate up to 180 beats per minute without experiencing any pain whatsoever. Gary is one of many people whose lives have been saved by what you're about to hear. So listen carefully. Who knows, your life too may depend on it. I'm pleased to be with you here at my home on the coast of California at uh, Salmon Creek uh, in the Big Sur region, uh, surrounded by national forest and the Pacific Ocean. And I'm glad to be able to participate in an international conference dealing with the prevention of disease, especially of cardiovascular disease, and of the value of uh, improved nutrition, especially vitamins, essential amino acids, and other orthomolecular substances in the improvement in the health and well-being of human beings uh, all over the world. For some time now, I have believed that it should be possible to get uh, nearly complete control of cardiovascular disease, preventing cardiovascular disease from developing uh, coronary artery disease, strokes, peripheral uh, circulatory disease, and other aspects of uh, um, uh, of heart disease and uh, circulatory disease. The reason for my believing this uh, is in considerable part uh, theoretical rather than based upon clinical evidence. I remember that Einstein said that if he read uh, about a surprising new experimental discovery that some physicists had made, he would not believe it unless there were a good sound theoretical reason for expecting this phenomenon to occur. Well, in this case, 
about vitamin C in relation to cardiovascular disease, the arguments are quite straightforward. For uh, two decades or more, the workers in the field of cardiology have said that the primary cause of cardiovascular disease is a lesion in the wall of an artery, a lesion occurring in a region where there's a particular stress close to the heart, say where the pulse is especially strong, or uh, where uh, an artery has a bifurcation splitting into two smaller arteries and there is turbulence. I remember that a dozen years ago, Brown and Goldstein uh, published an interesting article in Scientific American. Brown and Goldstein are investigators in Texas who received the Nobel Prize in medicine for their discovery of the uh, binding uh, region that holds uh, LDL, low-density lipoprotein, down. The first sentence in their paper was a statement, the primary cause of cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis and other aspects of cardiovascular disease, is a lesion in the wall of an artery. Well, a couple of years ago, one of my former students, my young associate, Dr. Matthias Rath, and I were continuing our conversations about the nature of heart disease. I mentioned that Brown and Goldstein had made the statement that the primary cause of cardiovascular disease is a lesion in the wall of a blood vessel, an artery, which is followed by a whole cascade of uh, efforts by the human body to control uh, this lesion, to heal this lesion. Fibrin and fibrinogen laid down and the cells get stuck there, become foam cells. There are many uh, effects that occur after what they call the primary cause, uh, the development of the lesion. So I said, you know, here's the question. Why should there be a lesion in the wall of a blood vessel? I think I know what the answer is. The answer is that people do not get enough vitamin C. Almost everyone in the world suffers from a deficiency in vitamin C. Vitamin C is a very powerful and important nutrient. It does many different things in the human body, such as uh, potentiating the immune system, making the immune system more effective and uh, protecting us against the disease. But there's one very important thing that vitamin C does uh, that uh, is related to heart disease. The tissues of the human body are made strong and tough by fibrils of the protein collagen. Collagen is made in rather large amounts in uh, human bodies and the bodies of other uh, mammals. It strengthens the uh, blood vessels and the skin and the muscles and the bones and the teeth very important substance. You can't make collagen without using up vitamin C. Collagen is made from another protein, procollagen, by 
hydroxylating lysyl and prolyl residues in the procollagen, converting them into hydroxylysyl and hydroxyprolyl residues. With every hydroxyl group that is introduced, one ascorbate ion, one molecule of vitamin C is used up. So uh, people who have a low level of vitamin C in their bodies because of a low intake of foods containing it or because of not taking vitamin C supplements, do not make enough collagen to make their tissues strong, and in particular, not enough to make the blood vessels strong. People who don't get any vitamin C for two or three months die of scurvy. Half of the people who die of scurvy die uh, because of internal bleeding. The blood vessels become so weak that they just burst open and uh, the patient dies as a result. The other half die of some current infection. Uh, the scorbutic patients are not able to protect themselves because they don't have enough vitamin C to make the immune system work effectively. So, the primary cause, and we published this a little over a year ago in the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine, the primary cause of cardiovascular disease is too small an amount of vitamin C in the human body. The result of that is that a lesion develops in the arterial wall, and that is followed by the whole cascade of efforts to uh, heal the lesion, and uh, including ultimately laying down atherosclerotic plaques of lipoprotein. Well, here we have now uh, an understanding of why cardiovascular disease has such a high incidence in human beings. Human beings are not able to make vitamin C, and they don't get enough of it in their foods to put them in really good health. The result of that is that lesions form in the arteries and uh, the person, 50% of the people in the United States and other developed countries uh, die as a result of uh, uh, coronary heart disease, strokes, or a peripheral circulatory disease, uh, a problem of that sort. What we need to do then is to improve the health through the intake of enough vitamin C to make the arteries strong, and in this way to prevent the high mortality from cardiovascular disease. Now, one important fact is that animals in general don't develop a cardiovascular disease that is similar to human cardiovascular disease. An animal that is fed large amounts, very large amounts of cholesterol, develops a sort of uh, heart disease, uh, but it differs in many respects from the cardiovascular disease that kills human beings. Why is that? The reason is that most animals manufacture their own vitamin C in their livers, and they manufacture it in such large amounts that their blood vessels and other tissues are stronger than those of human beings and do not develop the sort of lesions that uh, result then in overt cardiovascular disease such as humans get. 
We might ask what happened uh, several hundred million years ago when the first animals began running around and eating their close relatives, the plants. You know, we know that the biochemical reactions that go on in animals are very nearly the same, very little different from those that go on in plants. Uh, plants, all plants manufacture all of the vitamins, and of course they manufacture them in the amounts that put the plants in pretty good uh, plant health. Uh, Animals uh, who eat these plants are getting enough of most of the vitamins to keep them in reasonably good health because their needs for vitamin A and vitamin E and the B vitamins are pretty much the same as those of the plants. Consequently, the first animal ancestor of all of the present animals of eating his plant ancestors underwent a mutation or a series of mutations such as to lose the ability to manufacture these vitamins. That means that the animal was streamlined, that didn't need to waste energy and material making the vitamins because it was getting pretty good amounts in its plant foods. That's why all animals, men and other human beings and other animals, uh, require you know, vitamin A, vitamin E, B vitamins, essentially all of the vitamins. This didn't happen with vitamin C. Most animals manufacture vitamin C. And why? The answer to that is that animals need more vitamin C for good health than plants do. One of the most important jobs that vitamin C does in the human body is to manufacture collagen, which makes the tissue strong. It is the principal structural macromolecule of animals. To make collagen, you use up vitamin C. Plants don't rely on collagen. They don't manufacture collagen to make the plant structure strong. They use instead a carbohydrate called cellulose, which strengthens the plant tissues. Consequently, animals need more vitamin C than plants do. For this reason, practically all species of animals, dogs, cats, horses, cows, elephants, whales, and so on, practically all species of animals have continued millions of years after millions of years to manufacture vitamin C in their own bodies and not rely on what they get in their foods. Now, how much do animals manufacture? Well, it depends on the body weight of the animal. The amount manufactured per day is about proportional to the body weight. If you convert it to the weight of a human being, 70 kilograms an adult human being, it is on the average about 12 grams of vitamin C per day, 12,000 milligrams. The RDA for vitamin C given pronounced in the United States by the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Academy of Sciences is 60 milligrams a day. <coughs> animals, the average animal manufactures 200 times that much in his liver. 200 times that much. <laughs> Why is the RDA 60 milligrams? Uh, the statement by the Food and Nutrition Board is that vitamin C is important because it prevents scurvy. And many careful studies have shown that uh, 60 milligrams a day is enough to keep almost all human beings from developing scurvy.
And I agree, it is. 60 milligrams a day will do that job. What these medical and nutritional authorities have not done is to ask the question, could it be that larger intakes of vitamin C have much greater value in improving the health of human beings and especially in the prevention of disease and as adjuncts to appropriate conventional therapy in the treatment of disease? This is a question that I began to think about around 25 years ago. Um, when I had this idea, uh, when I realized that the vitamins have essentially no toxicity, that you can take a thousand times the RDA of vitamin C in one day or even every day for months or years without damaging your body, but in fact doing good, I thought I'll look in the medical literature and see what the optimum intake of vitamin C is, and the optimum intakes of other vitamins too. And, of course, I was disappointed when I looked in the medical and nutritional literature, I found essentially no information about the optimum intakes. As a matter of fact, uh, there was uh, some information in the form of reports mainly by individual physicians about the value of uh, vitamin C in larger doses or of other vitamins in improving the state of health of patients with cancer and other diseases, uh, heart disease, diabetes. One investigator in Canada 40 years ago said that in his opinion, cancer was a vitamin C deficiency disease. Another investigator in Canada around 35 years ago said that he had shown that patients with atherosclerosis uh, were benefited significantly by taking large amounts, one gram or two grams a day of vitamin C. Well, it's astonishing that even after these reports were published with evidence from, in the case of heart disease, from angiographs that the lesion, the plaques that had formed in the blood vessels had got smaller. Uh, the medical establishment paid no attention to this. Essentially, no research was done. I used to know a man, a biochemist named Erwin Stone, who had been, had had as a hobby checking up on vitamin C over a period of about 40 years, collecting all of the publications, mainly from doctors, about their observations of the value of vitamin C in seeming to help control, prevent, or treat uh, many diseases. In 1972, he published his book, uh, The Healing Factor, Vitamin C Against Disease. There were about 700 references to the medical literature in this book, all to, essentially all to papers which were reports by physicians that an increased intake of vitamin C helps prevent various diseases and helps in the treatment of various diseases. A hundred different diseases that seem to be uh, prevented to some extent by an increased intake of vitamin C. I think this book and the books that I myself published, such as Vitamin C and the Common Cold, had quite an effect on the public in general, but rather little effect on the medical profession, the medical establishment. Uh, for example, well, I may say there's been a significant change in the last four years. 
the Food and Nutrition Board and its last report, and other volumes too, other books about health published by the National Academy of Sciences, say uh, to be in good health, you must get good amounts of these three antioxidant vitamins, vitamin C and so on, and uh, uh, then the books go on to say, but don't take vitamin supplements. This seems to me just purely irrational. I just can't understand why uh, they include this advice, don't take vitamin supplements. You may have trouble finding foods that are high in the antioxidant vitamins, and of course they're expensive. And more than that, the amounts of these vitamins that I recommend to people for protection against heart disease and cancer and diabetes and various other diseases for prevention of these diseases are much larger than the amounts that you can get in your foods no matter how carefully you select your diet. So I'm hoping that the next step will be that the nutritional authorities and the medical authorities will include in their recommendations that uh, supplementary vitamin C be taken. In fact, a little over a year ago, uh, three investigators who are to some extent associated with the institute in which I work published the first really completely reliable epidemiological study about the value of supplementary vitamin C in the prevention of disease. The principal author of this paper was Dr. James Enstrom, who is a well-respected epidemiologist in the University of California in Los Angeles School of Public Health. Uh, the project was undertaken because of another associate of mine, uh, Martin Klein, who is one of the co-authors. Martin Klein used to be connected with the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in the United States. He remembered that this department had carried out a very large and expensive study of 11,348 adult human beings in the United States in 10 different regions over the country. This study involved interviewing each of the 11,000 subjects you getting questionnaires and among other things about their state of health and the amount of exercise and so on, among other things, what foods they ate, whether they had a good diet or a poor diet, and whether or not they took supplementary vitamin C. For some reason, although this study was begun in 1970 and uh, continued for more than 10 years so that each patient, was, each subject was followed for 10 years, for some reason, uh, no analysis had ever been made of the possible value of taking supplementary vitamin C until uh, Mark Klein suggested that the study be carried out by Jim Enstrom and his associate at the uh, University of California in Los Angeles. The amount of vitamin C that the uh, subjects who took supplementary vitamin C was getting was somewhere between five and ten times RDA. Uh, the persons, the subjects with a poor diet got less than the RDA of 60 milligrams a day. Those with a, a better diet, a good diet, including fruits and vegetables, got somewhat more, perhaps uh, twice as much, 120. Uh, 
and the ones who took supplementary vitamin C got probably somewhere around 500 or 600 milligrams, perhaps on the average as much as 10 times the RDA. There's much evidence that even the small amount of supplementary vitamins does a lot of good in improving health. Just an ordinary vitamin mineral pill, which would double the intake, because these tablets usually contain about the RDAs, the recommended amounts. Just taking a supplementary vitamin mineral pill does a lot of good, but taking more five or ten times as much vitamin C clearly does much more good. In this investigation of the 11,348 subjects followed for ten years, uh, information was obtained about the death rate and the causes of death. The study carried out by Dr. Enstrom and his associates gave the result that Men who took supplementary vitamin C, not a great amount, just five or ten times on the average, the RDA, had 42% smaller stand age standardized death rate from cardiovascular disease, heart disease, and strokes um, than men who just had a good diet but didn't take extra vitamin C. 42%. Their death rate, presumably the incidence of cardiovascular disease and the death rate, cut nearly in half, apparently just by taking this rather modest amount of supplementary vitamin C. The death rate from cancer of these men was decreased by 25%, and the death rate from diabetes, infectious diseases, was decreased by about 15%. Women, the women in this study, also were benefited, but to a somewhat smaller extent than the men. And uh, I don't know why, I don't think that Dr. Enstrom uh, has a good understanding of why uh, taking supplementary vitamin C does a, a lot of good for women, cutting down the death rate from heart disease by something like 30%, but even more for men, cutting it down by 42%. So here we have a thoroughly sound analysis of Prevention, prevention of death from heart disease and other diseases just by taking a modest amount of supplementary vitamin C. The biostatisticians and the, car the, the biostatisticians in particular uh, with whom I've had contact and who made published statements about this work by Enstrom seem all to have a high opinion of the work. They do not criticize uh, this uh, biostatistical analysis in the way that uh, sometimes uh, it's possible to criticize an analysis. I think there's no doubt that the incidence of and mortality from cardiovascular disease can be cut down really significantly by taking, by a large intake of vitamin C. I read a lot, actually hundreds of papers, about cholesterol, low density, lipoprotein cholesterol in the body and high density lipoprotein cholesterol. Low density lipoprotein is the, said to be the harmful one that causes atherosclerotic plaques by depositing cholesterol 
in the on the walls of the arteries where there are lesions. A high density lipoprotein is the good lipoprotein. <coughs> These uh, uh, lipoprotein uh, molecules uh, pick up cholesterol in the tissues and carry it back to the liver to be reprocessed or got rid of in the form of uh, uh, bile acids. Uh, we manufacture four grams of cholesterol per day, an adult human being, in the liver. It's a very important substance required for good health of essentially all cells in the human body. And the lipoproteins carry cholesterol through the circulation in order to move it from the liver where it's manufactured into the cells. Uh, we have you can't go on manufacturing four grams of, of cholesterol a day without to getting rid of some of it, or you'd pretty soon be turned into nothing but cholesterol. The mechanism of getting rid of cholesterol is to hydroxylate it into bile acids. And these bile acids are then injected into the uh, intestines and eliminated, although some of them are reabsorbed in the lower bowel and reconverted to cholesterol. Vitamin C is required to convert cholesterol into bile acids. So vitamin C provides us with a mechanism of protecting the body against having too much cholesterol. This is probably the main explanation of why many investigators who have studied vitamin C in relation to cholesterol have reported that uh, having a high level of vitamin C in your body is correlated with having a low level of cholesterol. And taking extra vitamin C decreases the cholesterol in persons who have uh, too high a cholesterol level. It helps to uh, stabilize the, the concentrations of cholesterol in the body at the right levels. Another way in which vitamin C and uh, vitamin E and beta carotene function to provide protection against heart disease is their antioxidant activity in preventing the oxidation of cholesterol to oxidized cholesterol. Oxidized cholesterol is a really harmful form, and the vitamin C and the other uh, vitamins, the antioxidant vitamins, uh, protect us by uh, preventing this oxidation. Now, there's been an interesting development during the last four years, starting about 35 years ago, in fact. Dr. Cora Berg, who is now Professor Cora Berg in Oslo, Norway, discovered a new lipoprotein in the blood of human beings. He named it lipoprotein A, lipoprotein small a. And ever since then, there have been many uh, investigators interested in cardiovascular disease studying uh, lipoprotein A and the protein part, which is called apoprotein A. Uh, the amino acid sequence is known, and it is known just what lipoprotein A is. Lipoprotein A could be said to be a derivative of LDL, uh, low-density lipoprotein. Uh, the LDL molecule consists of a protein called uh, apoprotein B, very large protein, 100,000 atoms in the molecule, uh, which uh, 
access the shell of a sphere, the interior of which consists of fats, lipids, lipids, especially cholesterol and triglycerides, but mainly cholesterol. And when apoprotein A is attached to the apoprotein B100 to make a protein double that size, then uh, that new lipoprotein, the interior being filled with cholesterol and other lipids, this new lipoprotein uh, is uh, present in the circulation, but usually in most people in rather small amounts, and some practically zero and some uh, 20 or 50 or 100 milligrams per deciliter. A number of years ago, investigators mentioned that in the atherosclerotic plaques, usually described as consisting of LDL, low-density lipoprotein, immunological studies showed that uh, lipoprotein A is present. During the last dozen years, 12 or 14 years, uh, Dr. Ursula Weissiegel in the medical school of the University of Hamburg in Germany has been studying um, cardiovascular patients uh, with respect to lipoprotein A. And year after year, she carried out studies. She and her assistants carried out studies. About four years ago, uh, she and her student, Matthias Rath, who later became an associate of mine, and two or three others, carried out a very careful study of uh, tissues, aortas, from patients who had had bypass operations involving removal of these arteries and replacement with saphenous veins, the bypass operation. And they were able to show that, in fact, the atherosclerotic plaques consist entirely of lipoprotein A, lipoprotein small a. No ordinary LDL, just lipoprotein small a. Moreover, other investigators have reported that uh, if you have uh, less than 20 milligrams, say between 10 and 20 milligrams of lipoprotein A in the human body, you don't develop cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Rath and I said the reason that human beings have so much lipoprotein A in their bodies is that their blood vessels are weak because of not having enough vitamin C to synthesize enough uh, of the uh, proteins, the fibrous proteins, collagen and elastin to make the blood vessels strong. And lipoprotein A is laid down on the walls of the blood vessels to help strengthen it, that it is working as a surrogate for vitamin C. Well, the manufacture of lipoprotein A is not well uh, standardized in human beings. The amount that puts people in the best of health is 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter. And people with that amount or a smaller amount do not have cardiovascular disease. But about half of the people in the countries where it's been studied have more than 20 milligrams, as much as 100 milligrams of lipoprotein A, and they are the ones who die of cardiovascular disease. The principal risk factor for cardiovascular disease is the amount of 
lipoprotein A in the blood. If you have more than 20 milligrams per deciliter, uh, you are at risk. Well, of course, not many people know, perhaps 1% or fewer, even in the United States and Great Britain, uh, Canada, know how much lipoprotein A they have in their blood because if you send blood in for analysis, they don't report it. It's just lumped in with the LDL, which is present in larger amounts. But uh, it would be a good idea for people who have more than 20 milligrams of lipoprotein A in their bodies to take action to prevent the development of cardiovascular disease. So now, what can they do? They can take extra vitamin C, several grams a day, at least three grams a day, and if they are really at risk, somewhat more, or if they have had a heart attack, or if uh, members, close relatives, uh, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers have died of cardiovascular disease, then these persons are at high risk for uh, cardiovascular disease and they should follow uh, an action, take more than one action to prevent that disease from developing. One thing that is known, we have studied it and others have studied it, is that uh, if you take large amounts of vitamin C, the level of, of, cardi of lipoprotein A in the blood decreases. So that's a method of cutting down on the chance of cardiovascular disease. And of course, that also uh, lowers the cholesterol level. Cholesterol is involved to some extent and uh, helps prevent the oxidation of the cholesterol to oxidized cholesterol. But there's something else that a person who is at risk or uh, any person can do uh, to cut down the incidence of and mortality from heart disease and strokes and the peripheral arterial disease. <clears throat> We can ask, why are plaques of lipoprotein A formed in the uh, arteries in places where lesions have occurred and the fibrin and fibrinogen has been laid down? Why? Well, the lipoprotein A sticks to the walls of the blood vessels in these regions because of the presence of fibrinogen and fibrin uh, with uh, uh, haptenic groups that grab on to the apoprotein A. And these haptenic groups are lysyl groups. They are the residues of the amino acid L-lysine, which is present in the blood of every human being, present in essentially all foods, uh, more in the proteins in meat and fish than in vegetables, uh, but present to some extent in vegetables too. It is one of the essential amino acids, lysine. Uh, a young adult male person uh, needs about 800 milligrams a day of lysine to keep in nitrogen balance. There are eight essential amino acids of the 20 amino acids. The human body can synthesize about 12, but it requires eight uh, from the food, from exogenous forces, sources, including uh, Lysine. Two and a half years ago, I was at a meeting of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. 
there was a little celebration uh, there of my 90th birthday and 58th anniversary of my membership in the National Academy of Sciences, USA. I was in the hallway of the Academy building and another member of the Academy came up to me. He said, uh, Dr. Pauling, I have heart disease. My brother and my father both died of heart attacks. Uh, I am a biochemist, uh, but I was retired from the National Institutes of Health several years ago for disability because of my heart. I've had three bypass operations. My saphenous veins have been used up, so I can't have any more bypass operations. I like to walk. But uh, I have trouble because after I walked a little way, uh, I developed uh, angina pectoris pain in my heart. If I take a nitroglycerin tablet, I can walk a little farther, and then I may have to take another nitroglycerin tablet. He went on to say, I have been taking vitamin C six grams a day or five five grams a day for several years uh, because of your recommendation. Um, is there something else that I could do that would permit me to walk? So I said, well, I'm, I can make a suggestion never been tried before. Take lysine, the amino acid lysine. Well, I didn't need to tell him what lysine was and that it's an essential amino acid and you have to get around a gram a day to be in good health and you get it in your foods. Because he he's one of the most distinguished biochemists in the United States, recipient of the National Medal of Science in the United States. So he said, how much shall I take? I thought, here, what do I know? I know that people get a gram or two in their food, depending upon how much meat and fish they eat, and that it's essential they have to get around one gram. Uh, it hasn't any known toxicity in animals or human beings. So I'll make a guess. I said five grams, five grams a day. So he thanked me. A couple of months later, he telephoned me and said, it's almost miraculous. I started taking a gram a day and then two grams and so on. Within a month after I had reached five grams a day of lysine in addition to my five grams of vitamin C, uh, I could walk two miles without any nitroglycerin tablets or without any pain in the chest. And he said he had cut down the amount of heart medicine he was taking in half. It's almost miraculous, he said. So another couple of months went by and he telephoned me and said, I was feeling so good the other day that I uh, cut down a big tree in our yard and was chopping it up for wood and I was also painting the house and I got chest pains despite his five grams of lysine and uh, vitamins. So he said, so I went up to six grams a day of lysine and six grams of vitamin C and now I'm continuing chopping down the chopping up the tree and painting the house. And now, a couple of years later, he's still in fine health. And so I published this case history, and uh, another heart patient wrote to me, well, I shan't to go into detail about her. Uh, she suffered from stress 
Aunt Dinah. Uh, she had a television show, and uh, if she were under stress in connection with the television show, she had to take a nitroglycerin tablets. If she climbed a flight of stairs, her chest would hurt, and she had to take. She was taking six or seven nitroglycerin tablets a day for several years. Also, she was taking vitamin C. And she said when she read the article about the first patient, she started on lysine. She has a PhD in chemistry and was a professor of chemistry in uh, uh, New Brunswick, University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And she said, Within three weeks after she had reached three grams of lysine per day, she was able to go all day uh, despite stressful occurrences without taking any nitroglycerin. And that she was setting off with her husband on a three months trip around the world. She's 67 years old, 68 years old now. So that account was published and uh, uh, also another patient so that I shan't go into detail about uh, who a patient who <clears throat> had had two extensive bypass operations and was told that he was in bad shape with his arteries clogged to the coronary artery clogged and <clears throat> that uh, he was not a candidate for another bypass operation or for another angioplasty. He was living in the same town as the first patient, and friends told him about the first patient, so he went to see him, and he said, it's almost miraculous. Within a month after he had reached five grams of lysine per day, he was riding into town from his house somewhat out in the country several times a week on his bicycle, a nine mile round trip, and was feeling fine, no longer just waiting around for his impending demise as the uh, physicians had uh, recommended him to do. Well, I don't know that there's need for a randomized prospective double-blind control trial when you get uh, evidence of this sort about the value of large intakes of vitamin C and also of lysine for preventing the deposition of atherosclerotic plaques and uh, preventing uh, death from cardiovascular disease. I recommend that every person, every adult, take three grams of vitamin C per day and smaller amounts for children proportional to body weight. That the, every person who is at risk for one reason or another from heart disease uh, take perhaps not only the vitamin C, five or six grams of vitamin C per day, but also uh, two grams or more of lysine per day. Two grams may well be uh, effective uh, prophylactically uh, for people who have not had heart attacks, but larger amounts might be needed for uh, people who are at greater risk for cardiovascular disease. So I believe that it should be possible, at any rate in the developed countries uh, who are uh, prosperous enough uh, to be able to uh, afford the rather small amounts of money needed for the vitamin C and the uh, lysine uh, to get uh, a large amount of prophylactic action 
against cardiovascular disease and against other diseases also, and uh, an increase in the length of uh, life, the length of the period of really good health, of well-being. So I am very optimistic about the future so far as cardiovascular disease goes. Thank you. I hope you've been impressed by the logic of this new approach to the treatment and prevention of cardiovascular disease. It involves the addition of vitamin C and lysine supplements. The lysine prevents lipoprotein A from sticking to the walls of the arteries and vitamin C helps to lower circulating levels of lipoprotein A. Dr. Pauling recommends three grams of vitamin C and one gram of lysine per day as a general preventative dose. And for those with cardiovascular problems, he recommends six grams of vitamin C and three grams of lysine. Both are natural constituents of food. Neither are unsafe, even at doses considerably higher than these levels. If you do, however, have cardiovascular disease, we recommend you carry out this advice under the guidance of your physician, together with a well-balanced diet and supplement program high in other antioxidant nutrients, such as vitamin E and vitamin A. Sadly, this is Dr. Linus Pauling's last contribution as he passed away in 1994, at the age of 93, not long after delivering this lecture. Dr. Pauling was a friend of Albert Einstein, and as much as Einstein transformed physics as we know it, so Pauling transformed our understanding of chemistry with the publication of his book, The Nature of the Chemical Bond, in 1939. For this, he received his first Nobel Prize. In the 1940s, his work led to the first synthesis of antibodies. He later discovered how anesthetics worked, which led to the development of new anesthetic agents. In the 1950s, he came close to identifying the structure of DNA. Had his passport not been confiscated by the US government, preventing him from coming to England where access to vital data would probably have given him the last piece in the jigsaw, he may indeed have won his third Nobel Prize. Behind the scientist was a great humanitarian who campaigned for world peace and ways to reduce human suffering. In 1958, he presented the United Nations with a petition signed by 11,021 top scientists from around the world, urging an end to nuclear weapons testing. And in 1962, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. The ban on nuclear weapons testing was effected on the day he received his second Nobel Prize. In 1965, his attention turned to the field of nutrition, and particularly the health-promoting effects of vitamin C. He identified the role of vitamin C in preventing many diseases from colds to cancer. Thanks to him, millions of people now supplement vitamin C and are healthier as a result. I came across his work in the late 70s and was struck by his simple and completely logical concepts, which inspired me, then a psychologist, to investigate the whole idea of disease being the result of suboptimum nutrition. When I first met him in 1990, I knew I was in the presence of someone very special. Linus had a delightful twinkle in his eye that was full of wonder, an open mind backed up by a superb intelligence and encyclopedic knowledge. Optimum nutrition, he told me, is the medicine of the future. For all those who've been inspired by his words, we share the loss of a truly great man, whose vision has uplifted and will continue to uplift humanity. That was his true genius. Thank you.